Well, what the hell are they? So, I'm going to give you my little definition. If you catch a little bit of my bio, my undergrad is actually split between English literature and biology. So I wanted to be a field scientist, but I got burned out, so I switched to English literature. I graduated undergrad, and my mom said to me, who's a librarian, mind you? What are you going to do with an English degree? I'm going to cherish it. Look at me now, mom. Look at me. So words are important to me. So I'm not going to assume that you don't know what a honeypot is, but I'm going to tell you what my definition is so that when we're operationalizing these concepts, you can understand where I'm coming from. I wanted to be a field biologist because I love observation. I love watching. If you hang out with me, you'll notice that I stare a lot. It's not because I'm trying to be intimidating. I'm not an intimidating person. I don't want to be. But I like watching how people behave and how things behave because what things are and what people are is very important. That's what makes them them and not something else. And so to me, a honeypot is a service or a system we deploy to lure behavior into us. Why? Why would you want to do that? Well, primarily you want to study it, right? Really, if you think, anybody here love going to the mall and watching? Yeah, well, the pandemic ruined it. Fuck yeah, honeypots, I love them. Because that's the digital 21st century version of mall watching, right? You really think about it. You're luring in behavior so you can watch it. Now, most of us, my profession is in academia for the most part, and so I use honeypots to study tools, techniques, behaviors of adversaries. I, I would argue that that's mostly what people use honeypots for at this point. However, we do have the ability to deploy it as a deceptive control. The idea being that I'll lure the adversary over here so that they don't attack over here. Anybody run a honeypot in production? Yeah, I did at one company. Um, I guess it happens. But here's the crazy thing about honeypots is nobody knows, other than those of us that will be honest and transparent, on this path to glory, of how many there actually are. Now, that's what a honeypot is. That's why we use honeypots. So how do they work? This is where the semantics become important. I'm going to primarily talk about what I refer to as high interaction. The polar opposite of that is low interaction. Completely makes sense, right? High, low. You have medium, you have honey tokens, you have hybrids, you have honey nets. All this crazy stuff, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm going to try and do is give you base concepts and ideas so that you can take this and apply it in different contexts. That's my job today. And so I'm interested in high interaction honeypots. What I mean by that is I want to lure you in and let you do whatever you want to do. And I need you to do whatever you want to do for as long as possible so that I can maximally study your behavior. If that becomes limited in any way, if I limit a blue team, I'm not fulfilling my purpose. My honeypot is flawed. Now, low interactions, for those of you that might be curious but not aware of this, really are just connection watchers. A low interaction honeypot really just wants things to connect to it so it can track the connection itself, not the behavior. Remember, I come from the liberal arts. Behavior is important to me. Observation is important to me as a field scientist. So, speaking of behavior, what do you guys think would make a good high interaction honeypot a good high interaction honeypot? Because a good high inter interaction honeypot is not a bad high interaction honeypot, is it? The word's different. It's not a medium interaction honeypot, and it's not a low interaction pot. So that must mean something. What are those characteristics? I'll go back to you since you were so brave the first time. What do you think would make a good high interaction honeypot a good high interaction honeypot? Mm, okay, okay. Anybody else? Or am I still calling on people? I'm a professor by trade, I'll call on you all day long. Yes, my man. Right, okay, so I'm, specifically interested in SSH. And so if I have a high interaction honeypot that is mimicking SSH, it better behave like SSH. I should not be able to tell the difference, right? Because if I can, that's bad. 
Anybody else? Ideas for characteristics, yes. It doesn't look like a honey pot. It shouldn't be sticky. Now, and I mean that because we can actually quantify that. One of my research teams, two years ago, we published some research in which we were able to operationalize that variable of time and stickiness as what's called sojourn time. And this is why you being in the honey pot maximally matters. If you connect and disconnect, it, it's a waste of a socket. I need you to run around and run amok, which is a whole set of can of worms, but we'll get to that shortly. Anybody else, any ideas? Yes. Lucrative, right. I mean, wh why, do you, why does Winnie the Pooh stick his face in the honey pot and get stuck repeatedly? Because honey tastes good, dude. Like, right? Who in here doesn't like honey? All right. I'm going to give you my definition. These are great ideas. It must be discoverable, right? So if I'm exposing SSH, but as a honeypot, I need you to be able to find it. If you can't find it, you can't connect to it. If you can't connect to it, you can't behave within it, right? It has to be accessible. So I actually have to let you connect as if it's a real SSH connection, and it better behave like that, or somebody's gonna be like, something's up. That's weird, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. And last but not least, it must be interactable. You have to be able to do what you would normally do. I would assume most of us have some experience with SSH in just a normal sysadmin type role, right? Anybody use Telnet? Can I have your IP address? <laughs> Listen, I'm before lunch. If you don't laugh at my jokes, I'm not letting you go. I'll talk nonstop. I'll filibuster this bitch. I'm not your typical academic, right? I get it, dude. It's all right. Okay, so that's honeypot. Now let's talk about detecting, and that's the rest of the run for us, okay? As a researcher, why would detecting honeypots be important? And these are all bifurcated. There's two sides to each one, one of these. So I'll tell you this. The idea of detecting a honeypot and how to do it is not new. I did not invent this. This is one of the beautiful things about science. All we have to do is find the right shoulders to stand upon. We only have to find the right heroes to follow to the dragon. It makes your job way easier. You just have to pay attention and be observant. As a researcher, I want to know if my honeypot is detectable, because if it's detectable as a honeypot, you're not going to connect, you're not going to interact. That's not good for me if I'm studying something. On the other hand, I want to know that when I'm going out and doing some type of, let's say, offensive research, that what I'm connecting to is not a honeypot. Because believe it or not, students do crazy shit, and in a lab, they'll set up a honeypot instead of a real server, and they'll be like, oh, you can't hack me. This is why I learned real quick not to place bets, right? Like you think, oh man, I'm hot shit, I'm the professor, I'll, I'll pop your box and I'll win 20 bucks. Not that I would ever take 20 bucks off a student. I'd take a beer though, for sure. Right? They get clever. Okay, so what about for adversaries? What if you're red teaming? What if you're doing a pen test? What if you're just curious? Like does anybody ever get curious and just scan the internet? I did, I did, and I'll tell you about it in a minute. But if you're an adversary and you're motivated to attack a system, don't you want to know that that's the actual system you intend to attack, not a honeypot? Like that might be good to know. And so this, this research is motivated upon a decent, albeit small, base. Related work is very important to me as a scientist. This is what's crazy, I'll blow your mind. If you had to guess, this is a blind guess, I'm assuming on most everybody's part. Do you think, I'm talking about the scientific literature, do you think there's hundreds of studies on detecting honeypots? Do you think there's thousands? Do you think there's like five? Anybody got a guess? Five. Anybody else? It's non-zero and it's not negative. Hey man, loopholes, dude, right? Five's a really good guess, 20. The entire scientific field of detecting honeypots consists of approximately 20 studies. 
I'll further blow your minds. You, I hope I am. You tell me if I'm not. Act like you are. Make me feel good. Of the 20, there are two that are the nexus of that graph of citation. That's it, two. And they're all within the last 10 years. There's a span of time from like 2010 to 2020. There's not a much before and there's not much after until now. Now, yes, please. Correct, correct. In journals, conferences, so forth. That's a great question. Great segue, thanks. If we take the community, or sometimes what I refer to lovingly as the subculture, that is the hacker cons, how many do you think there are there? And these are exclusive. They, there's no overlap here, which is an interesting side tidbit. Your guess of five is almost spot on. Now, this is also one of my motivational missions here, is I'm going to try and give you my view of it as a, as a legit academic researcher and try to have a dialogue with you so that we can bridge this. Because the fact that those two families are that small and exclusive, they don't know each other, but they have overlap and concept is bad for the community. That should never happen. We should all be working together with our skill sets and views and perspectives and pushing this forward. I'll tell you why at the end. I'll tell you why at the end. That was a great question, thank you. So before I move on, I'll just say this. My work's built on prior work, right? There's a few things that are new in here that I'll, I'll tell you when they're new. If not, assume that I'm citing something. If you want citations, I'll give you my references. That's not a problem. But why can't I leave this alone? Because it's, it's curious to me as a scientist, there's a 10-year span with 20 studies, five subculture pieces of, of research, and that's it. This is what I would refer to and what I would push you, especially in this new beginner mindset, right? That when something catches your interest, that, that's you talking to you. That's the spirit mercurio. Pay attention to that. It's going to lead you somewhere fruitful. The other thing is honeypots have an enormous amount of potential. They're an underutilized technology, especially for researching, whether that's me in an academic setting or us as a community doing our research. There's really no distinct difference. You don't think you're a scientist, but you are. You're following the scientific method. You just may not be aware of it. That's the beauty of science. It doesn't care if you're aware of it. It still exists, right? They have a lot of potential. One of the things I'm interested in and what I think this could head towards if we fix these flaws that I'm going to point out to you in detecting them, has anybody ever, it's, it's this big marketing thing, and I don't mean the marketing thing because it's this pet peeve of mine. It really gets me angry, of an artificial immune system. Honeypots will play an indelible role in that. Why do we need an artificial immune system? What's going to take care of the starship when we're traveling to the edge of the galaxy and we're all in hypersleep? Not you. You're in hypersleep. You're going to trust an AI to do it? That's a bad fucking idea. We need technology that we can understand and control and implement that will work the way we want it to. And there's good analogs to be mapped between the way a honeypot could work for us in detecting things passively and how a mammalian, specifically a mammalian immune system works. Actually, I like the plant model better, but that's a whole other presentation. The other thing is it's hard. Who in here wants to work on something easy? I don't think anybody in here wants to do the easy thing. That's not why we're here. We're here to slay dragons. It should be hard. That makes it meaningful. Plus, I think they're pretty cool. Honeypots. Okay, so here's what I did. I took a model from one of the scientific studies, dang at all. Um, pretty cool paper. Sometimes if you've read any scientific literature, there's a bad habit of people leaving out critical parts. And I'm here to tell you as somebody that's had to go through peer review endlessly for the last 10 years, it's not always your choice as the author. There's a lot of editorializing, or editorializing, if you will, of what gets put into a paper when it's published. Sometimes things get cut. So I'm not blaming dang at, all, dang at all for this, but they presented a model that made sense to me, but it was incomplete. 
And what they left out was the part that I'm really going to start talking about now, which is these characteristics. What makes a high interaction honeypot emulating SSH a high interaction honeypot that's emulating SSH? And how can those characteristics exist such that it's not able to be differentiated from a real, let's say, open SSH server? And so that's what I looked at specifically. I looked at Calry, which is probably one of the best well-known, not best honeypot for SSH specifically. And I looked at open SSH. And so the first thing I did, because I tend to be theoretically oriented, um, this is the humanities and, and the liberal arts in me, right? So I tend to think in concepts first and build models so that then I can rig up validation experiments and test those models. I scanned a lot of IPs, okay? There's, of that 20, there's two studies that scanned the internet. One of those studies quantified that, and it was 8.4 million endpoints they scanned. I'll talk about that at the, at the end, because of course it's important for us to calibrate our work. I have results, but where do those results situate within this continuum of research? But I scanned about 60,000 IP addresses across one provider. Uh, anybody live in Triad Piedmont? I live in Winston-Salem. And so our main ISP there is North State, and I scanned their entire backbone. Not once, not twice, but thrice. Three, three points, right? Triangulation. Funny enough, side note, I remember when I first got into the community, I went to DEF CON. It must have been like DEF CON 10. And I was blown away by going and watching, to, watching and listening to Fyodor talk about NMAP and how he had got fail banned and repeated cease and desist letters from his ISP for scanning. I scanned three times with no limits. And I was, wait, I was really hoping I'd get a letter or an email. I didn't. Nobody gives a shit anymore. It, it's so pedestrian now to port scan, but there's so much you can learn. By the way, all of my raw scan data is in the GitHub repo that's associated with this presentation. So if you want to go look at that, you'll see everything that's in there. There's all kinds of cool stuff. I mentioned that because one, it's contextualized for the work, but North State, because it serves primarily residential communities, constrains this work a little bit. I took the IP information, munged it, which I'll talk about in my tool chain in a second, and then I put it through this detection model. Some of that, well, I'll say this. In the beginning, it was manual. I like to calibrate my instrumentation manually first and then automate pieces that make sense to automate. And then I did a series of validation experiments. I did three for triangulation. Two of them were in uh, a closed, isolated lab, and then the third one was against those IP addresses. Here's how I did it. Trust the NMAP. Did a full connect scan with OS fingerprinting and just let it go. It took a while. It took a while, man. It took a while. And I have pretty decent in internet, right? What I found is those endpoints don't. I swear some of them had to have been on dial-up. Uh, TCP dump. I didn't capture traffic for all the scans because that's a lot of PCAP, but I have one complete set of PCAPs. Those are not in the GitHub repo because they're far too large. If anybody ever wants to look at them, I'll give you my email at the end. I'm happy to share them. I just can't host them there. Then NMAP to CSV. I like comma separated values. Nice and neat to sort and search and, and do stuff with, except it had one problem for me. Uh, I didn't want to look at empty results. I don't care that a node was there with no ports. That doesn't help me for this, right? So I had to actually modify that instrument. I have a pull request open with the original author. I don't know if he's active anymore, but I have an updated fork in my GitHub. And then a lot of skull sweat, which I don't think any of us are afraid of, are we? Sometimes you just got to get in and tinker. Perfect. This is the model. Yes! So basically what this comes down to is I have a set of targets, that's S, I have a set of characteristics. That's what we're discovering together. I gave you my definition of some. And then what I want to do is generate a set of results that are binary, zero or one. Either it is or it's not a honeypot. Now, this is where you have to be careful. I am never going to tell you that I am certain something is what it is. What I'm going to tell you and what my model produces is let's, let's call it a likelihood or a percent similarity. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, that's how these characteristics are rigged up to work. 
So real quick, science always has constraints and we ought to be honest about our assumptions and our limitations. One, it's blind. I have no idea what's on North State's network other than what I have. I could have gotten banned instantly and this would have been a real short talk, right? You don't know what's gonna happen in the wild. That's one of the cool things in one way, but it's blind. It's also remote. All this work was remote. That's important. I'm gonna say it's passive and active, and this is one of the conceptual flaws I'll talk about in a little bit after the results about honeypods. Um, a lot of the literature that exists, both the community literature and the scientific literature, works on detecting honeypots by actually log, trying to log in, logging in, and doing stuff. Looking at kernel modules, looking at directory structures, looking at what binaries are available or not available, what permissions are there, things of that nature. That's great, that's awesome, that's one way to do it, and it's probably a better way to do it if you want to get closer to 100% certainty. I don't require 100% certainty, and I sure as shit don't wanna log in and get trapped. Right, I'm trying to trap the trap. I don't wanna fall into the trap and get trapped, right? Make sense? Okay. So what I'm looking for, very quick, simple, TCP handshake, one packet, done. I'm gonna call that passive. If you wanna call it active, I'm not gonna argue about it, but that's my definition for the context of this work, okay? Let's call it low, inter low interaction for a high interaction honeypot. That's clever. Put that on the t-shirt, dude. Fingerprinting. I don't want fingerprints. I don't want signatures. A lot of the literature works off of very discreet antiviral type signatures. If it's this, it's that. That's great as long as that is that, but when that changes, your signature's dead. It's a waste of time. What I'm interested in are universal concepts. Okay, so what's the difference between a firewall and a router? I'll give you a, a, an analogy. Because they can act the same way. They work at the same layer in OSI, right? Their purpose is different. The way they do what they do is fundamentally different. And so if you're able to talk about that as a concept and then rig it up into a model and then apply that model as a characteristic, bam, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Because now you cannot change something that breaks my detection. I will always be able to detect you as you. We've all been wearing masks for like two years now, right? And at first it was really hard to differentiate between people because we don't have the physical clues. But I think we've all, tell me if I'm wrong, adapted somewhat to being able to differentiate people even though half your face is hidden, right? That's con concept, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Oh, so what could we use? We talked about what you think some characteristics are. What do you think I actually did? Any brave heroes left on the road to glory? I guessed, yes, yes. I started with a priori guesses about what do I think it ought to be? What will it reveal to me with minimal probing such that I can then operationalize that into the model? I really look for some funny cartoons, right? I mean, you gotta have them. Uh, this one really made me giggle. <laughs> it did, man. I don't know what to tell you. So this is what I operationalized to begin with. This is not the end, okay? This is not the complete set. I'll give you an example of a bad guess, because I think scientists in particular are bad about telling you when they're wrong. One of the first things I thought about was time. If I have calorie, and I make a connection attempt to it, and I have open SSH, and I make the equivalent connection to it, right? My guess was I bet calorie takes longer. Why? Why would I guess that? It's not written in the same code. It's not the same language, right? Calorie is Python written on top of twisted conch. Open SSH is C-driven. It better be faster. Okay, well, Jason didn't think about the internet and the internet being the equalizer of time, right? So that was a hidden constraint that I didn't think about in that guess. So I'm telling you right now, you can try this if you want, your mileage may vary, but I sat for an entire day making connections, with, even within my LAN lab, right? Not across the internet, and time does not work. There's too much variance in how long things take. So boom, off the list. Connection, what do I mean by that? 
what I'm interested in, what I observed very quickly, was that Cowrie and OpenSSH do not behave the same way when the connection is initiated. They both do TCP handshake because they're TCP, right? And that's governed by the kernel for the stack. There's no variance there. But above that, when the software's loading it and managing it and interacting with it, there's big differences. So right off the bat, I noticed that the protocol banner that SSH servers send back to you so that the client and the server then know they're on the same version, they don't act the same way. Now, you won't see that in the client. You've got to see that in a packet capture. But it's clear as day. It, was, it stood out. I'm like, oh, Eureka. I even texted my wife. I'm like, dude, I did it. Eureka, fuck yeah. Then I thought, well, that's only one point. Like, I could probably have a lot of false positives. So state. Here what I'm interested in is what happens next. Because I'm going to chain these on a conditional probability. So if that protocol banner mismatch happens, that's true. What next could be true so that I'm more reasonably sure that that is a honeypot or not? State. So here what I'm looking at is how that connection after it's established, is managed. And what's going on? Well, what happens next in an SSH connection? We have the protocol. It matches. Client and server can talk because they're on the same version. Well, now we've got to negotiate crypto. Right? Do I speak the same algorithms? Who in here thinks Cowrie and OpenSSH speak the same algorithms? Don't be shy. Because I guessed yes. Why wouldn't they? Wrong. Wrong. They're different. Perfect. Two points. How about behavior? Now, this is where things get fuzzy. Because remember, we don't want to log in and tinker. We don't want to log in and tinker. But what if, oh, God, what if? What if I just hit enter? I don't type a username. I have my third point. Does this make sense? Now I have three characteristics in my C set. I'm ready to go. If you're curious, here's all the blocks belonging to North State that are public that I scanned. And that's about 60,000 IP. Um, I'll come back to the volatility. I didn't expect this, especially in so much residential net space. But there are a lot of systems that weren't there, that were there, that were there, then weren't. It was really volatile, and I didn't, I didn't anticipate that, which affects the work. But, so, I do the scans, I got my data, I got my characteristics, I'm, now I need to pull this data into my model and see if I actually have something here. So, I run Nmap to CSV, get it into a mungible format, I write a little bit of uh, code to help me, I isolate out results that are only TCP22. Now, as a side note, and I'll call this up uh, back to this later. If you ran a honeypot, because if you don't know this, Cowrie serves SSH and Telnet, which is why I asked about Telnet, right? If you were running an SSH honeypot, Cowrie, would you also expose 23 to try and maximize the amount of connections you could take? I really thought about this because what I ended up with, um, yeah, let's just get into this. What I ended up with out of that 60,000 IPs was 405 hosts running SSH. Okay, that's workable. That's workable. I didn't work against this, but I called it out because it's interesting to me. Of the 405 exposing 22, 200 of them, around half, also, also exposed 23. That could be a characteristic, but I didn't think it was reliable, and I didn't want to work with two different protocols at the same time. I just wanted to establish the model, validate it, and then move forward. Here's the operatization of those characteristics into the detection function. Now I'll get into the results. You'll cheer for me, and then we'll all go have lunch. In that order. Yeah! I'm going to tell you about the total number of hosts. I just kind of gave you a preamble to that. I told you about the host running SSH. And then you're really curious about, did I detect any honeypots across North State's backbone? And if I did, how many are there? That's the heart of it. And then I'll give you some takeaways, some interesting notes, some ideas for future work. Um, by the way, if anybody ever wants to collaborate on this, I'm always happy to party with people. 
Here's the protocol banner I'm talking about. Um, a and B, sometimes I like to pretend I'm an optometrist. I've spent a lot of time at the optometrist, so I'm used to the A, B, one, two tests. If you had to guess between A and B, which one is the honeypot, because one of them is, you got a 50-50 shot, right? This is a blind constraint. Which one do you think is the honeypot, A or B? Oh, controversy at hand, yes. My job is fulfilled. B. B. What was the clue? What was the giveaway for you? It's lacking the operating system specification, right? But that, that first part of it looks pretty normal, right? It, out of, if you only saw B, you wouldn't guess it's a honeypot, would you? No. But right away, bam. This is the importance of, of, of observation, especially in isolation, is because you can look for specific things and you don't have distraction. As a scientist, we call those confounding variables. That's probably not strange to you guys, right? We don't want confounding extraneous variables. I want to look at what I'm looking at. And so right away, all I did was initiate the connection. I haven't pressed enter yet, right? Not at the login prompt. Now, the way I got this, the way I got this was I made the connection, the server sends its string back, right? And then I just take that string and I send it right back to it. I just echo the string back. And that's what causes that difference in behavior. To me, that's the geeky 21st century of having rats in a maze. Oh, by the way, before I go on, because this ties to the next algorithm piece. So that next burst of bytes that comes in are the set of algorithms and key exchange mechanisms that those servers can use. Do you see the difference? Yeah, right? I mean, A is much more robust. Well, yeah, it's a real open SSH server, right? Calorie is much more limited. Well, and, and we can make guesses, right? It's not using the same libraries, if you will, to, to create that. So it doesn't have access to the same crypto. That led, that was a clue to the next one, okay? Now, this is my client. I've initiated the connection, so I'm at the same step in the net flow. But now I'm looking at my command line client, right? That last one was all done through Python code. That way I could capture the response and send it back. What's the difference? Same question, A or B, which one's the honeypot? They got any Bs? Just for the controversy? Yeah? It's B. Yeah, right? Oh, and I don't know why, right? That we, don't, we don't have to, we're not charged with explaining why this is, but there's a difference in the key that's being used. That means the algorithm that's being used in the encryption for SSH is different, right? Calorie uses RSA. I think OpenSSH is using a much more modern elliptical curve. That's why it's using that, right? Funny. So I got those, that's when I got into, well, is the time different and the way they're responding? I think there might be some things because there's other people in the literature that have found, uh, let's say artifacts in the key negotiation that can be leveraged. I put those aside because I just wanted something quick and easy to work with. And I just got curious. So I looked at time wrong, a couple other things wrong and wrong. I really thought I was not doing well. And then it actually a fortuitous mistake. I hit enter thinking I was disconnecting from the session, and I sent an empty password. Or empty login, I should say, I misspoke. Empty authentication, let's call it. That's behaviorally different, is it not? So, we ain't gonna break the trend now. A or B, which one's the honeypot? B? Anybody else? A is the honeypot, I tricked you. I did two Bs and an A, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, that is strange because what really caught my eye, and I almost missed this. I almost missed this. This is why you do multiple tests, right? A is calorie, and for the first three, 
it doesn't react to empty authentication. It just prompts you again. After three, and it's always three, it's always three, it reacts just like OpenSSH. So it's, it's like it's slow, it's stuck in the honey. That, that's a joke. I'm not gonna let you go to lunch. <laughs> and then it acts like OpenSSH. Now the other thing you'll notice too that's different is that last line. What it actually says when it's denying you. Now, here's another like partial fail for a characteristic, but if anybody wants to take this and run with it, have at it. Observationally, but I, I'm not able to confirm it yet, have you had this experience where you're connecting to a server and, and you mistype or you forget and you type password, 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 and after the third time, bang, you're kind of timed out, right? And that's a good mechanism to have for anti-brute force mitigation, right? There were several times where I was able to get OpenSSH to act the way you think it would, which is after X number of logins failed, it just won't take that connection on that socket anymore. At the same time, I had Calry never do that. But then sometimes it would. I don't have an explanation for that. I didn't dive into it, but that's an idea. Because again, this is minimal interaction. Like how many failed login attempts do you get on SSH every day if you're watching your logs? Millions? There's actually a quantity called shitload, and that probably fits that, right? It's a lot. So it's, it's pretty innocuous as things go. So we've not really disclosed ourselves as trying to detect this honeypot. talked about that. Oh, this is something interesting too, by the way. Uh, these are the types of SSH servers in that sample of 400 and some. Uh, drop bears the most. That's home routers and modems. Um, there's a bunch in there that personally I'd never even heard of. Open SSH, second most. And that's where the honeypots are. That's where the honeypots are. This is what you wanted to know. Did I detect honeypots? Yes, I did. Well, I detected endpoints that exhibit characteristics similar to a honeypot. That's the right way to say that. Okay, They had those characteristics and they behaved in those manners consistent with the model, consistent with my lab validations. Seven of them. Does that seem like a lot to you guys? Out of 400, it's about 0.01%. How would you tell? Well, we go to the literature. And remember, I told you of that 20, there's two where they scanned the internet at large and they reported their results. And so, uh, Morishita, there was a Japanese team that scanned the internet. And I've actually reached out to them and talked to them about how they developed their signatures and their characteristics. They didn't use a model like this. Um, and so we had some good dialogue and we got into it and they scanned 8.4 million endpoints. What do you think their rate of detection was? Because they found honeypots. What if I told you it was 0.01%? That's what they reported. The other study um, scanned, I, if I remember correctly, about three times the amount of hosts. It was somewhere in the order of like 30 to 40 million endpoints. They detected honeypots. Their detection rate was 0.04%. And so we're within this range of demonstrable evidence, right? And so that kind of makes me stand back and be like, okay, like this has a, a probability of being accurate. I wouldn't say precise. I don't need precision. It's not certain, but it seems to be consistent with the model. That's what we're looking for, right? So a couple of interesting side notes. North State's volatile. There definitely were things that were always there across all the scans I did. And like I said, there were batches. And what's interesting, they were in batches. They were in batches. When I did the Nmap dump to CSV and I looked at it and sorted it, not only were the systems exposing 22 in groups, funny enough, right? They were adjacent, makes you curious. But then the groups of hosts that were coming in and out between scans were in contiguous segments. It's kind of weird. Now, I don't know what it's like down here in Durham, Raleigh, but where I live, I live a little bit out in the country, and, and a lot of that part of Winston-Salem is rural. It could be power. There were storms coming through. Who knows? I'm talking about the volatility of the machines being there and not being there. There's all kinds of explanations. 
Timing's unreliable, I talked about that. Scanning's cool. There is so much, if you wanna get started, one thing you can do is just fire up Nmap. Learning how to use that tool is fantastic. I've actually used it way more in troubleshooting as a network engineer up until now. But it's a fabulous tool. Mapping a network, you'll learn so much. Last but not least, honeypots are conceptually flawed. Um, the whole idea of a fingerprint is flawed. How we construct a priori a honeypot is flawed. We're not luring people in and maximizing our sojourn time. We're making a best guess at, at how to emulate an existing service and hoping that we get just enough information to make it worth our while to do that, right? Um, for those of us that have used them in production to deflect, I don't, how do you demonstrate that it actually worked? I don't know. I don't know. You're proving a negative in some cases. I mean, just because something hit that but didn't hit your production system, does it mean that happened because it's a honeypot? I don't know. I'm also very curious if anybody wants to do any follow-up, I got the scan results in GitHub, of where honeypots get placed in a network. Like, how many of us put our routers at dot one and our core switch at dot two? Super common, right? Credentials are usually first initial last name or some variant. We have habits, behavior. So where do people put honeypots? I don't know, but we could find out because I have the data now, at least for North State. And I think some of that will help us fix these flaws. Honeypots are real, they're there. So now there's at least three pieces of evidence between my work and the other two teams. They exist and they're out there, which I was actually kind of surprised. I thought they were like the boogeyman or Bigfoot. People talk about them, there's books written about them, but who actually uses them and deals with them? It's a very small community within a community, within a community. I think this model has value for us. I think we can extend it by adding more characteristics if we're very clever, which that's why I come to you as a community. We're nothing if clever. And honeypots are flawed and I'm interested in fixing them. Um, I don't think it's as simple as taking a real system and putting it on the internet and saying, have at it attackers. That has problems. If that box gets popped and you don't have a way to archive that information for research, what, what do you, like, it's flawed. If I don't use a real box and let it have vulnerabilities, how do I entice you to stay on that system so I can study you? So I gotta give you some honey, but how do I do that? So I think the answer are what we can call pattern recognition receptors. This is a biological term. This is how the immune system works. There are, and this is key, active components of our immune system that look for foreign agents. And when they detect those foreign agents, they don't do anything. They send a signal and they go get the people that really do it. And this is one of the things that's flawed about the honeypot is it itself is inherently passive. It only collects what it can based on who connects to it. And so if nobody ever connects to a honeypot, it has no value. That's immensely conceptually flawed. So how do you create an active honeypot? You need a receptor, something that'll actively go look for attackers and bait them into it. I'll leave it there because I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> but I think there's potential for what I would call a honey bot that can go crawl things and look for opportunities to set itself up and, and lure behavior into itself. And with that said, if there's any more questions, I'd be happy to answer them on our way to lunch. You can catch me, I'm here all day. You can always email me. That's the GitHub where this presentation and the scan file is. And again, it's a raw scan. That's not the wrangled munge data. Um, if you want PCAPs, you can hit me up. We'll arrange a way to get them because they're large. They're not small and there's a lot of them. Uh, and with that said, now's the time you clap.